Thanks, everyone. And for joining me today, joining us today, uh, and um, to, to talk about a subject that uh, uh, is uh, kind of little known. There isn't, there hasn't been much written about it either in existing histories um, or in more um, more modern um, uh, um, uh, articles and. Um, uh, research efforts. It, it seems as though uh, this is um, uh, this, the, the slavery, the, the topic of slavery in Delaware County is, is not, um, first of all, commonly recognized. I think you're probably as surprised uh, as I was to discover that there were, in fact, enslaved individuals in our rural county. Uh, and uh, it's kind of mind blowing when you think about it. I mean, this is not the South, you know, this is, we, we are familiar with those images of, uh, of um, cotton fields and tobacco farms and, and large plantations with many enslaved people. We've all seen those photographs uh, and familiar with that story, but the localized version of that um, is not so well known. And I'm really, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to tell you about it. Uh, it's, it's not a happy story, but it's one that we all should know. This is our shared history, and uh, it's, uh, it's important that we all understand this. Um, we, we are, of course, uh, you know, familiar with um, our, our forebearers trek here from uh, the Hudson Valley and from New England. Um, these were, as, as we like to believe, you know, hardworking, God-fearing pioneers who ventured into the wilds uh, of, of Delaware County and the greater Catskills to forge a new path to find opportunity and secure for their children a brighter future. By the sweat of their brow, they cleared forests, created homesteads and communities. Their children and their grandchildren faced all kinds of challenges and calamities but they persevered against all odds and we admire them for it. We are honored to tell their stories, but it's only part of our collective story. Some of these settlers brought dark skinned men, women, boys and girls to help them saw the timber, scratch furrows into the earth to plant the food they would later prepare for their owners and to care for the livestock and the white children who arrived at regular intervals. These African-Americans didn't choose to come here, were not paid for their labor, could not leave if they wanted to. They were enslaved, owned like cattle or furniture by some of the same folks who had declared that all men are created equal before they went out and beat the British and headed west to find liberty for themselves while they held other humans in bondage. For generations after those first settlers arrived, slavery persisted, even grew in Delaware County until it was abolished in New York State in, in 1827. So before I share with you what I've learned about that local story, uh, let me provide a little bit of background. The Dutch first brought kidnapped Africans to New Amsterdam in 1626, just seven years after they delivered to the Virginia colony 19 black men who had been seized from a Spanish slave ship. This was the beginning of 200 years of sanctioned human ownership of what became in what became New York State. The Dutch, followed by the English, and then by the state of New York, permitted, encouraged, and normalized a process which today seems unimaginable. And yet it happened. In 1790, New York State's population of 340,120 inhabitants included 21,324 people identified as slaves. New York had the largest number and highest concentration of enslaved people north of Maryland. Most were in New York City and in the Hudson Valley. 
New York City was second only to Charleston, South Carolina in the percentage of enslaved people at about 14%. Admittedly, only 14, uh, quote, slaves in nine households were counted in the 1790 census in the three towns from which Delaware County would be formed. These towns were Middletown, Harpersfield, and Woodstock. Nine households reported slaves. Uh, George Sands in Middletown enslaved three people. Alexander Boyd in Woodstock, four. The rest won. Boyd, by the way, later moved to Middleburg, where he had a large farm and 11 enslaved people. His son James, interestingly, became an ardent uh, activist for the abol abolishment of slavery. Um, so in this slide, I've, I've uh, marked the jumping off points for um, folks who are coming from Connecticut, Massachusetts, and downstate. Um, you'll see the the, uh, the dots there, um, Catskill being um, green and Kingston being red and Woolworsing being yellow. That blue dot up above is um, Batavia, which uh, actually is Wyndham today. And I've underlined the east and west branches of the Delaware River, um, which is where many of the newcomers settled you know, along those, those wide, um, very fertile river valleys. So Delaware County was formally erected in 1797. In 1800, 11 households in the county enslaved 20 people. In 1810, there were 26 households with 41 slaves. In 1820, the numbers rose to 41 households and 60 enslaved people. Over the four federal censuses, we counted 133 enslaved individuals in 89 households in Delaware County. Um, there's some um, um, duplication here, basically, because you know a lot transpired between those censuses. Um, so we can assume that there actually were more people in both columns when you account for births, people moving into and out of the county and the trading of humans between censuses. Um, so an example of, of this um, aspect is related in Munsell's History of Delaware County, which referred to the records of the Franklin town clerk showing that two enslaved uh, people were manumitted or freed by their owners. Platt Townsend freed one described as a, quote, Negro wench named Jin on October 3rd, 1794. A man named Titus Enos, who was the property of William R. Halsey, was set free January 17th, 1817. These individuals were certified to be under 45 years of age, of good health, and of sufficient ability to provide for themselves so that they would not become wards of the state. These records are signed by the justices of the peace, overseers of the poor, and the former enslavers. Neither Platt Townsend or William Halsey are shown as having slaves in the 1790, 1800, 1810, or 1820 census, but these manumission records show they clearly did own human beings between these government population counts. Um, I put this um, um, uh, scan of the um, part, part of the census record uh, for 1800 on here so that you can see um, you know, how uh, the census records were set up. Um, the heads of households were shown in the left-hand column, and then each of those uh, individual columns involve, uh, you know, describes how many uh, white males of a certain age and white females. And at the very end, that last column on the right is uh, headed slaves. So you can see by this that Roswell Hotchkiss um, in Harpersfield who had 11 people in his household, had one slave. 
the image at the bottom uh, there shows a, a historic marker for Dr. Platt Townsend, who it says was the leader of the founder, one of the leaders of the, the founders of Walton. Walton was originally part of Franklin. So Dr. Uh, Townsend, as I just read, um, shows up on the Franklin, um, in the Franklin records as having manumitted a slave. Um, it doesn't say that, as you can see on that historic marker. So here are the Delaware County people whose names did appear on those four census counts. This is a, a, a total, there's two slides here. Um, and this is a cumulative record. Um, I didn't, I couldn't divide it into census counts, but I did divide it into towns. Um, and so during this period, um, there was at least one enslaved person in every town in the county, except Hamden and Masonville. So I'll let you look at those names for just a minute. Some of them are not familiar to us anymore. Um, these are folks who came and left. Um, and I can't account for the spelling in all cases either. Um, the, the census records were notoriously, uh, census takers were bad spellers. Uh, you can see some, some familiar names there though, I think people who are either still around or have made their mark on local history. Well, I will say that um, there were also uh, 43 households headed by a free black person in Delaware County um, over those four census years. These were men and women who had either been born to a free black woman or had escaped slavery either literally or by being manumitted by their owner. Uh, the white men who owned the most African Americans were Cornelius Newkirk, George Sands, and Alexander Cockburn of Middletown, Louis Hardenberg of Roxbury, John DeWitt of Stamford, and Alexander Cole of Colchester, who in 1820 owned seven people. By far, most Delaware County slaveholding households, consisting of anywhere from three to 17 people, claimed one or two enslaved persons. Just two of those households were headed by women. It's probable that most operated modest farms or small grist or sawmills, and that enslaved people worked alongside their owners and perhaps lived in their houses. I recently um, came upon a diary of an Englishman who spent a year living with 12 other people in a small four room farmhouse in Stockbridge, Massachusetts in 1775. In that diary, he related that aside from family members, there were two hired girls and three farm laborers, one of them a Negro man who at mealtimes was forced to eat by himself. While the few beds were shared by everyone, it does not mention where um, this man was allowed to lay his head. Nor have I found descriptions of mixed race living arrangements in Delaware County. Many local enslavers were men of means who came from wealthy and well-connected families in the Hudson Valley and New England. Some had gained renown in the military in the business world or in politics. One, Samuel Sherwood, was a US Congressman representing Delaware County in Washington from 1813 to 1815. In 1820, he held one enslaved person at his Delhi estate. One of Sherwood's Delhi neighbors was Ebenezer Foote, a Connecticut native Foot served in the colonial army during the revolution, was at Bunker Hill, and was for a time assigned to George Washington's staff. On a cold December night, the story goes, 
He escaped the notorious British Bridewell Prison in New York City by paddling on the plank across the Hudson River. After the war, he had a store in Newburgh and was elected to the State Assembly, where he was influential in the creation of Delaware County in 1797. The governor appointed him its first county clerk, and he wasted no time in coming to Delhi to claim land that was awarded him for his war service. There he built a beautiful home overlooking the West Branch of the Delaware River. Uh, it, was, it, it was then and is still known as Arbor Hill. He was later appointed county judge and ever after was referred to as Judge Foot. Despite being in the Delaware County wilderness, Judge Foote and his wife, Jerusha Purdy, remained connected with the movers and shakers, hosting visits from the big names of the era. Stephen Van Rensselaer, whose vast estate made him the 10th richest American of all time. Morgan Lewis, who was governor of New York from 1804 to 1807. DeWitt Clinton, who was mayor of New York City, and the sixth governor of the state, and the notorious Aaron Burr, to name a few. Helping in the house and on the farm were enslaved men and women. In a collection of letters and documents compiled in 1927, their great-granddaughter, Catherine Adelia Foote, writes, Mrs. Foote must have had all of the executive ability we have heard of to have entertained suitably the constant stream of guests with the trials over getting supplies delivered in good order, if at all. The mistress was sure of service as long as slaves were to be had, and in that lonely land, men of culture and refinement were worth much trouble and anxiety. The letters also paint a picture of just how callously enslaved people were bought, sold, and traded. Catherine Livingston wrote to Ebenezer in the spring of 1800, quote, on the subject of accommodating you with a Negro woman, which I'm told you are in need of. The one I have to dispose of is 21 years of age. And the reason for parting with her is her having a young child and the father of it not being married to her and not acting agreeable to me. My wish is to remove her from him. She is perfectly honest and sober and until now was very useful to me. But now there is three in my kitchen under a 12 month. I am under the necessity of parting with her. If you are in want of a woman, she will answer, being acquainted with all kinds of country and housework and perfectly well disposed. I gave 70 pounds to her for her, but to have a good place for her, I shall not differ about the price. Uh, that price would have been about $175 today. Uh, and it doesn't sound as though the child was part of the transaction. The following year, Elias Butler, himself an enslaver in Colchester, appeared to be the bird between foot and a man named Constant Andrews, who had a female he wanted to sell. Writing from Walton, Butler informs Foote that he has, quote, closed the bargain to wit, the wench to be your property and at your risk in a fortnight from last Monday. You are to give your note for the sum of $100, payable in 12 months with interest, $50 to be paid by the 1st of June next, on the receipt of which he is to give you a good bill of sale. You have her very cheap, and I am sure you will like her. That unnamed woman purchased in 181 uh, may be the same, uh, the same person that Ebenezer advertised for sale in the Ulster County Plebeian newspaper in 1814. You can read along with me, I'm sure here. I wish to dispose of a female Negro slave. She's about 27 years old. She understands and is capable of performing every kind of housework well. Her faults are an aversion to living in this country where there are very few black people with whom she can associate and to much impudence occasioned by an excess of indulgence. 
the vices of stealing, intoxication, etc., she is not guilty of. She has resided 15 years in my family, and was she contented, I would wish her to remain. I will sell her for a reasonable price, but would prefer exchanging her for a female aged 12 to 14 years of age who had a time to serve, as I think a young one would be more content to live where there are no black people in the neighborhood. Ebenezer Foote writing from Arbor Hill in Delheim, September 24th, 1814. So there's a, an ironic twist here. Judge Foote, it turns out, was the brother of Eli Foote, whose daughter Roxana married Reverend Lyman Beecher and was the mother of abolitionists Henry Ward Beecher and Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, of course, Harriet Beecher Stowe was the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, the anti-slavery novel that is credited with fueling the abolitionist cause in the 1850s. So they were children of um, Ebenezer Foote's niece. Across the county in Roxbury, another interesting historical connection has come to light. Isaac Hardenberg, who built this impressive stone house around 1800, was the son of Colonel Johannes Hardenberg, who utilized slave labor on his town of Esopus farm in Ulster County. Among the individuals he purchased were James and Elizabeth Baumfrey, whose daughter Isabel was born on the estate in 1797. Johannes' son Charles, Isaac's brother, inherited the farm in 1799. And when Charles died in 1806, Isabel was sold away. Her story after that, full of heartbreak and courage, was lived under the new name she gave herself, Sojourner Truth. Many years later, dictating the story of her life, she described how the 10 or 12 slaves slept together in the cellar of the hotel Charles Hardenberg had built. It's only light consisting of a few panes of glass and the space between the loose boards of the floor and the uneven earth below was often filled with mud and water, the uncomfortable splashings of which were as annoying as its noxious vapors must have been chilling and fatal to health. She recalled, quote, the inmates of both sexes and all ages sleeping on those damp boards like the horse with little straw and a blanket. We have to ask what sort of accommodations Isaac Hardenberg provided for the enslaved people in his house. For in 1800, while Isabel Baumfrey was a child of three on his brother's farm in Asopus, Isaac Hardenberg harbored five slaves on the Roxbury farm that was part of the one and a half million acre Hardenberg patent awarded by Queen Anne to his great-grandfather. Isaac was married in 1782 to Rachel Graham, and they had seven children. There was reputedly a record of Isaac purchasing two people, Michael, 11, and Nan, four, for $150 in 1792, though we have not found that document. We do, however, have this document. Um, as required by law, Isaac reported to the town clerk of Roxbury the births of babies born to women he owned. Isabel was born March 10th, 1802. Amos, born April 26th, 1804. Nancy, who was one month and 23 days old on May 7th, 1806. According to the 1799 gradual abolition law, these children were now, quote, free, though they must continue to work for their mother's master until the females were 25 and the male 27. Isaac was required to report their births. John T. Moore, the town clerk who signed this report, himself owned two slaves in 1820. 
Well, Isaac built a sawmill and a grist mill on the Bear Kill stream and kept a store in the basement of the stone house, which was located on a busy westward turnpike. He was Roxbury's first supervisor from 1799 to 1806. When he moved to Catskill, his son Lewis became the owner of the Roxbury Stone House homestead, along with several enslaved people, six in 1810, four in 1820. And we have this from the history of the town of Roxbury by Irma May Griffin, uh, who, uh, whose book was published in uh, 1975. The Hardenburg slaves are still recalled through stories handed down from neighbors of the Hardenbergs. Best remembered is old Lonnie, the faithful Negro nurse who brought up the Hardenburg children. There was Dinah and there was old Pop who could plow, although he had one hand missing and only three fingers on the other. When slavery was abolished in 1827, Michael bought in 1792 and Lonnie immediately left, my, immediately left. Michael never returned, but memories of the only home she had ever known proved too much for Lonnie, who shortly returned never again to leave. Well, Lonnie, also known as Dion in census records, was shown as the mother of five children in the 1865 census. Might Isabel, Amos, and Nancy have been hers? She was 95 in 1870, and the census taker penciled once a slave next to her name. What became of her children? And where were Lonnie? Old Pop and the Hardenbergs after uh, and the Hardenbergs other slaves buried. Uh, the stone house is now on the state and national registers of historic places. Um, in that um, registry application, there's no mention of uh, an on-site uh, graveyard. A few miles away from the Hardenburg Manor House, near what is now known as Hubble Corners on Route 30 in Roxbury, was this beautiful home. It was built in 1818, perhaps with the help of slave labor. <laughs> this was the home of Jonas Moore, who with wife Deborah Persons reared nine children on the farm they bought in 1790. The first reformed church services and local Masonic meetings were held in Jonas's barn. He served three times as supervisor and was also a state assemblyman. He was a son of John and Betty Moore, Scottish immigrants who settled in what is now Grand Gorge and whose descendants spread out to establish homesteads throughout the area. In 1820, Jonas headed a household of 10 people and one slave. His brother, John Taylor Moore, the town clerk I mentioned, held two enslaved individuals. 180 years after Jonas built his house, it was moved piece by piece to Otsego County and is now part of the Farmers Museum, Cooperstown. Tour guides and costumed reenactors there tell visitors all about the Moore family and antebellum rural life but nothing about the fact that its builder was part of the New York slave network. Sometime in the 1780s, the Sands family arrived in Middletown and began a dynasty of sorts along the East Branch. Father George, his sons George, Abel, and Samuel, his grandson Edward, and his nephew Benjamin were slaveholders in Middletown and in Hancock down the Delaware River. This was the impressive Sands House, which was claimed for the Papacton Reservoir in the 1950s when this photograph was taken. The Sands was prominent on Long Island and Dutchess County where they controlled many slaves. The Centennial History of Delaware County of 1897 relates that they brought several slaves with them to Middletown. 
The McLean sawmill below the Sands farm was formerly the site of a grist mill, and it is authoritatively stated that there was one still earlier known as the Wench Mill. The name alluded to the power used being nothing more than the strength of some female slaves applied to the lever to propel the machinery. George Sands and family operated the grist mill, a tavern, <clears throat> and a store. <clears throat> Interestingly, George Sands, with other patriots, signed the Articles of Association in Dutchess County in 1775 and served in the 4th Regiment Dutchess County Militia during the Revolution. His sons, Abel and Edward, however, were Tories and evacuated to Canada in 1788. Abel returned to New York after his brother's death in Canada in 1803. Like his father and brothers George and Samuel, Abel appears as a slaveholder in Middletown in 1810 and 1820. He died in 1821. Over in Hancock, Benjamin Sands, I think that was Benjamin Sands Sr., reputedly purchased a 3, 000, uh, about 3,000 acres in 1792 and made his way from Poughkeepsie with his family, uh, four enslaved people and their possessions in two wagons pulled by a team of horses and a yoke of oxen. They located along what is now called Sands Creek. More than a century later, the Hancock Herald said Mr. Sands with the aid of his slaves built a cabin, a dam across the creek and a large sawmill. It also says Benjamin and his family and the people he held are buried in the Presbyterian Church Cemetery in Hancock. The family stayed in town for generations. This 1856 map shows many of, of uh, many households by that name in the Sands Creek area. Another story of divided loyalties is that of the Stockton family. The story of Walton, published in 1975, has this. As with most who came in the early days, Charles Stockton was related to some already here. He had married Elizabeth North, sister of Gabriel and Robert, when she was but 15. He had been in Newtown during the war when the British were quartered there. Charles had a commission in the British Army, which had been bought for him by his father a man of means and of Tory sympathy. Both families opposed the marriage as Elizabeth's father and brothers were fighting for the Patriot Army. So after the war, to escape the bitterness, Charles Stockton, his wife, three children, and a colored girl named Trace set out for Walton, where he had purchased 350 acres from Christopher Tappan on the south side of the river. <clears throat> They arrived at what would become Walton the first day of December, 1787. That winter, they lived with Gabriel North and his family in his one room log house. By the next spring, Stockton built a log house on his own property across the river. He eventually added 1150 acres of adjoining lands to his holdings. Later, he built a very large and commodious home on what is now Stockton Avenue and Titus Place. It was the, it was that, that house was demolished in 1850. Charles Stockton had one slave in the 1790 census. Could this have been Trace? There were eight in the household that year. And one slave in 1820, a male, 26 to 44. A girl named Mary was part of the Abel Downs household in what became known as Downsville. Downs property included uh, what is today the Downsville Central School, the farm across the road, the fireman's field, and all the other land on Maple Avenue and Main Street down to the Delaware River. Abel Downs opened a store in the center of Downsville, had large farms and a leather tannery. He was postmaster in Colchester and served as town supervisor. Land sales and development, lumbering and the tannery provided most of his wealth. 
His son, George W. Downs, continued these businesses and also operated the Downs House Hotel. Well, Abel Downs had one enslaved person in 1820. Likely, it was the servant he freed in his will in 1823. It says here, at my decease, I desire that my servant girl, Mary, shall receive her freedom, together with one bed and bedding, one cow, and a comfortable supply of wearing apparel. It's not known where Mary took her bed and her cow when she left or what happened to her. The emancipation of slaves in New York State was a process that unfolded painfully slowly, over a generation in fact. The 1799 gradual abolition law declared that children born after July 4, 1799 to enslaved mothers in New York would be born free, but would be indentured, meaning they would have to provide free labor to their mother's masters until they reached 25 if female and 28 if male. Because the law applied only to those born after 1799, slavery continued for those born before that year. So a final act of emancipation was needed to eradicate slavery in the state. One was passed on March 31st, 1817. It provided for emancipation 10 years later in 1827 of people born before July 4th, 1799. But those born after July 4th, 1817 were to be indentured servants until age 21. Moreover, until 1841, travelers from outside the state could bring their enslaved people into New York for up to nine months. This must have been a tense and complicated time. Take Delhi, for example. In 1820, four white people had free blacks in their households. William Elring, Isaac Hathaway, Amasa Parker, who would later become the judge in the anti-rent war cases, and Gurdon Edgerton, who ran a hotel. But Erastus Root, John Broadwell, and Samuel Sherwood declared four slaves between them in Delhi, that same census. Plus, there were three free families of color in the town in 1820. So there were free blacks, free but indentured blacks, and enslaved blacks awaiting their freedom. What were the social distinctions and dynamics between and among them and within the community? Um, it's interesting to note that Erastus Root, keeper of two slaves in 1820, had been a state legislator when the 1799 Gradual Emancipation Act was passed. He later said that he had attempted to limit the period of indentured servitude for black children to 18 years for females, 21 for males, the same limits that were enforced for white children bound out as indentured servants. I urged the propriety of putting the children of slaves upon the same footing as children of freemen, that they were so already, both by the constitution of the state and by divine law. Whether Erastus Root freed his own two slaves early is not known. One young man who was labeled free in 1820 was apparently still beholden to Gurdon Edgerton in 1826 when Edgerton ran this ad in the Delaware Gazette October 23rd, 1826 ran away from this subscriber on the night of the 22nd instant, a Negro boy named Syme or Simon, about 20 years of age, five feet two or three inches high and thick, set with a waggish walk. Said Negro wore away a snuffed coat and trousers, had with him a great coat, one extra pair of shoes and a change of linen. His hands something scarified from cuts and bruises, any person that will take up and secure said Negro in any jail in this state and give information of the same to the subscriber shall be handsomely rewarded and all reasonable charges paid. 
G. H. Edgerton, Delhi, October 23rd, 1826. Well, young Simon must have been caught and returned to Edgerton, who, as I mentioned, ran a hotel in Delhi where the young man likely worked. But Sim was determined to be free and evidently did not intend to wait another seven years for his indenture to end. A year after his first attempt, he tried again. The ad read, stop a runaway, ran away from the subscriber on Sunday evening, the fourth instant, a Negro man named Sime or Simon, about 21 years of age, five feet four or five inches high, thick set, has a waggish walk. He has a scar on his upper lip and his hands are something scarred by cuts and bruises. Said Negro wore away a white fur hat, black coat, black vest, white or snuff colored pantaloons, leather stock and cowhide shoes. Any person that will take up and secure said Negro in any jail in this state and give information to the subscriber shall be liberally rewarded and all reasonable charges paid. Well, that ad appeared in the Delaware Gazette, November 5th, 1827. Simon was still bound to Edgerton as he had not yet reached the age of 28 even though other slaves were free as of July 4th that year. <clears throat> well, it's not known what happened to Simon, uh, the uh, freedom seeker. Did he leave the state? Was he captured a second time and returned to Gurdon Edgerton? Did he find sanctuary among free black households? There were 29 of those in 1830 in Delaware County, five in Delhi, including three households of Bennetts. The Bennetts, the Mondors, the Collinses, and other free Black families whose progenitors escaped or were granted freedom decades before have inspiring and compelling stories of their own. Perhaps we can get to them in a future program. <clears throat> so many enslaved people were denied names, except those given to them by their enslavers. Even in death, many are anonymous. Nowhere is that seen more clearly than in this map of what is believed to have been a burial ground for the slaves of Alexander Cole and their descendants. It was located at Cat Hollow in the town of Colchester. The remains uh, taken from 33 graves, were moved above the encroaching waters of the Papacton Reservoir in the 1950s. <clears throat> As you can see in this map and key done by the Board of Water Supply, most were marked by field stones. Only two, shown by the arrows there, had headstones. One was for William Smith Wilson, a young man who died in 1849. The other is for Philip Cole, a son of Henry Cole, who may well have been a Cole family slave. <clears throat> Philip was a teenager when he joined the Union Army to serve with the 20th Regiment of US Colored Troops. He went as a substitute, meaning someone in Colchester paid him to go in their place. Philip survived, returned to Colchester, married, and had several children. He died between 1875 and 1880. This marker, replacing his deteriorated headstone, was placed over his relocated grave when the Papacton Cemetery of the Unclaimed was restored a few years ago. It stands for all the nameless people who once lay with Philip Cole in the Cat Hollow burial ground and who now rest beside him at Papacton. Perhaps one of them is a Negro boy named Tom, who was three years old, the 4th of March, 1813, or a boy named Benjamin, born the second day of January, 1813, or a girl named Jen, born on the 20th day of January, 1815, or maybe Harriet, born on the 20th day of December, 1816. All of these children were born of enslaved women owned by Alexander Cole. Who were their mothers? Who were their fathers? What were their young lives like? 
Did they eventually taste freedom? What became of them? We are left to wonder, to say their names, and to belatedly and gratefully add them to the ledger of Delaware County history. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I also want to give um, thanks to Joanna Titus for encouraging uh, research on African American themes, um, and of course to the Mountaintop Historical Society for sponsoring this program. I also uh, want to make special mention of Shirley Hauk, uh, the former Deputy Delaware County Clerk, who did years worth of work um, compiling, documenting, assembling records having to do with Delaware County's history and making them accessible. Um, she, I, I, I received a, 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 I got a lot of information from the materials that she had assembled. She was working on a book on the African American experience of Delaware County and had begun a manuscript uh, when she unfortunately passed away and was unable to finish it. Um, that material is, however, um, at the archives at Delaware County Historical Association. So I thank them and Ray Lefevre for helping me go through them. And I'd also like to thank the folks that, whose names you see on the screen for um, assisting me with this program, um, guiding me and, um, and helping with the research. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions, though I have to tell you that uh, I am definitely not an expert on this subject. Um, this is really just uh, a start. Uh, this is just scratching the surface of this very deep, complex subject, which I hope to continue to do, and I hope other people will, uh, will do the same. If you found a storyline that interests you, uh, I hope you will pursue it. it, it um, uh, it's a fascinating topic and one that we all need to know more about. The, the, the sad thing is that, you know, there is so much information about enslavers, about um, people who held slaves, particularly the, the more prominent individuals, because they were the, you know, wealthy white men of some power and privilege. Um, and they're the ones who make it into the history books. Um, so I'd like to know more about the um, individual farm families that felt it uh, necessary to have um, enslaved people helping on their homesteads. And I'd like to know more especially about those poor people, those people who, who um, against their will were, were brought here and, um, and forced to, do, to, to labor um, among you know, strangers really um, for no pay. And um, we, we don't know what kind of conditions. We don't know if they suffered abuse. Um, we, we have those, you know, couple of first person accounts that I read from other, up, you know, New York areas. But um, I really, I really would love to know more. And so I encourage you to, um, to pick up the ball and run with it if you're so inclined. And in the meantime, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and if uh, there are any questions, I can try to answer them. Thank you so much, Diane. This is Alexandra. Um, yeah, I think everybody, I'll just speak for everybody because not everybody is able to unmute themselves to so thank you again for all the time that you put into this really in-depth research, sharing these very important stories and perspectives and also leaving um, important opening and space for future research and future sharing. So we've received several questions. I'm gonna go up toward the beginning of those. And I'm also going to share in the chat now uh, a list of resources that Diane has very graciously allowed us to share for people who wanna do more research on their own. So I'm gonna put that in the chat now or perhaps in just a moment, it's not, um, it's not allowing me to, to share right now for some reason. So one, one of the early questions we received was from Jennifer who said, uh, didn't Morgan Lewis own much land that is now the Margaretville area having married into the Livingston family? Are you able to speak to that, Diane? Um, 
that sounds familiar. Honestly, there were um, the Hardenberg patent was um, divvied up in so many ways among so many people that yes, the Livingstons um, owned a good share of this area. Um, and, um, and Morgan Lewis married into the Livingston clan and it was Margaret Lewis Livingston, Margaret Livingston Lewis, who, who uh, Margaretville is named for. Uh, so, uh, but beyond that, I couldn't tell you the, you know, the, the dividing lines. There are maps, but I don't have them committed to memory. Sorry. Thanks for the question, though. Okay. And then we have a question from Hank, a more general question about uh, whether or not you've come across any evidence of underground railroad in research, I'm presuming. Well, that is a difficult subject. Um, the, um, it's tantalizing, uh, but I, I have not found any, um, do, there, there, any documented underground railroad sites. Uh, I was just thinking about that a little bit more this morning, too. And um, because the um, Arbor Hill, the Ebenezer Foots home over in Delhi, Supposedly, I mean, there are lots of legends and you hear lots of, you know, you often hear stories about underground, you know, strange underground rooms, hidden rooms or tunnels and but nobody's ever actually shown any to me. Um, but at Ebenezer Foote's house, supposedly that's one of the stories there that there was a tunnel that would take people to the west branch of the Delaware River. Um, to escape, I, I don't, I don't know um, what era we would be talking about here. But then it occurred to me, you know, so if you got on the Delaware River, that would take you to the main stem of the Delaware River, which is west, and then, and then what would you do? <laughs> You'd end up if you stayed on the river, you would be in Delaware Bay. You'd be headed south again. So that kind of doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, the answer to your question is I, I don't I don't have any evidence that there was um, activity re regarded the, regarding the um, Underground Railroad, either in the period when there were slaves here, which was up through, you know, 1830 or so, or later um, in the period when there would have been um, them escaping slaves from the south coming north. Um, I, I honestly, I don't know. And we have another question about whether or not you know if slave owners paid taxes for owning slaves. Um, uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I think so, but I can't answer. Um, maybe somebody else who's listening knows the answer to this question. Um, but it's not a topic that I looked into, although I believe they did, um, and but, but honestly, I'm not going to answer because I would be wrong. So sorry. Understood. And just as a note to anybody who's curious right now, you'll be able to view a recording of Diane's talk on our Facebook page and also on our YouTube. And we have one more question, which is uh, well, we have several more questions. The next one is: Are there any church records or evidence? of the enslaved people's religious life that you came across? Um, not locally. Um, I, uh, in the, it's, it's, I've been made aware that um, in the Hudson Valley and, uh, and other areas um, where the Dutch predominated, um, it was uh, a common practice to baptize your enslaved people to, you know, um, to save their quote heathen souls unquote, um, and so there are church records that uh, that show baptisms of individual enslaved people who were you know with their owners having brought them to the church for that purpose. Um, I have not seen anything local uh, here. I mean, church records here. Uh, really don't go back that far. I don't know. I don't know where we find those. And a point of clarification, I think here is just exactly where is Cat Hollow Cemetery that you asked? That's um, from Sean. They're wondering if it's on Route 206. It was. 
it's now it, it it it's um it was removed and taken to um the new york city road off of trumpers kill road between trumpers kill road and um in andes and um downsville and there's a the city bought a farm at the top of that mountain and um buried people who were not whose remains were not claimed by family members um so it's um uh, it has the graves of a number of cemeteries from both Papakton and Cannonsville Reservoirs. And the next question is from Richard, he says, thanks so much for the talk. And that um, they've noticed that on area maps, there's something called Negro Hill located roughly east of Roxbury, north of Fleischmann's and south of Grand Gorge. Do we know any of the history behind the name? Yes, in fact, we do. Um, it was, uh, that was an area that was settled by the Mondor family. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, that family ha, ha, stems from a, uh, an individual, Joel Mondor, who with his wife and son, Jadathan, were um, emancipated in, um, uh, down in uh, Columbia County, Amenia. I think that's Columbia County, maybe it's Duchess. Um, and they made their way west and, um, and established um, a, a thriving family that um, went for generations and is still here. Um, Rich Walling, who is the president of the Stanford Historical Society, actually just recently did an interesting program about the Mondors um, in Stanford. And maybe that's posted somewhere, but I would um, I would encourage you to look at that. The Mondor family, actually members of the Mondor family, Nathan, uh, his wife, and a brother or two, also lived in the town of Middletown, and um, purchased land off of Dry Brook on um, a, a road, also unfortunately called Negro Hill. Only not as nicely as that. I see, thank you. We have another question which asks, are there former enslaved people or freedmen buried in the Cat Hollow section of the Papacton Cemetery? That's besides Mr. Cole. I have no idea. Nobody knows who's buried there, except, except for um, Philip Cole and um, William, Henry, William Smith Wilson, um, who was born in, I think, 1831, so he, um, he, he was not born a slave, uh, so, but, but Philip, I think, was the son of slaves. Um, but I, other than that, as you could see, that picture of, of, the, of the unclaimed cemetery where it was just wide open, there was one, one headstone there, and that was for uh, Mr. Wilson. And a question from Ava, could you speak a little about your research methods? How were you able to find these photos? and documents beyond the census? Hmm, well, uh, <laughs> uh, the photographs, um, the, 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 the two or three photographs that I used of, of um, African-Americans were not local. They were just used as illustration because we don't have any photographs of these folks. Um, or and, and certain there weren't been, there weren't photographs even during that era anyway, but um, it was just, they were just used as illustration. The records, um, uh, well, the, the the photographs or the illustrations or the the um, paintings of um, of the the enslavers were you know I mean they were famous people, so those were those were real and those are part of the historic history, historic record. Um, the records. Um, I used were, you know, there were clues all over the place. Shirley's um, material had um, references to various books, various um, sources. Uh, and, you know, for instance, there was a, an article that I read in the Catskill Mountain News from like, I don't know, 1950 or something like that. Um, writing about local history and particularly about Roxbury. And it said that the town clerk had this, this um, record showing births of babies, of the Hardenburg babies. And so 
um, I prevailed upon my friend Anthony Liberator, who's the Roxbury Town historian. Could you please go and look at the go to the town clerk's office and see if by any chance it's still there, you know, 70 years later, I mean, actually 200 years later. And, um, and he did, and it was and that's what we he scanned those pages. And that's what I, I showed. So those kinds of discoveries are really um, uh, exhilarating and really important. Uh, and that's why we have to keep looking the, the the research is just begun so um you know it's it just it's just a matter of beating the bushes sometimes thank you diane and i just was able to finally put in the chat which is a link to the bibliography or additional resources that diane compiled for everybody so hopefully you'll be able to access that and to clarify again that you'll be able to access a recording of this video on the Mountaintop Historical Society's Facebook page and also on our YouTube page. So our next question from Jonathan is whether or not they saw correctly that the totals of enslaved people increased in Delaware over the period you analyzed. Any thoughts on that? Um, yes, it did. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, my thoughts are that, um, uh, that the population itself was increasing and that, um, I'm, you know, no doubt the 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 number of enslaved people was increasing as as births happened, um, and and people, you know, arrived new people arrived with enslaved folks or traded or sold. What I'd really like to know more about one of the many things I'd like to know more about is where did households. Um, I hate to use the word acquire because it sounds like property, but that's kind of what they did. They bought and sold. How, you know, where did they go if, if somebody needed a, uh, a, a house servant or thought they did? Um, you know, I mean, were there, did they have to go to the Hudson Valley, to New York City, to a, a slave market or to Albany, where I understand that there were a couple of auction sites there or or did they just rely on their contacts like as we saw in the Ebenezer Foot um, letters where uh, Catherine Livingston wrote to him and said you know I have a, a woman I'd like to, to you know dispense with and um, and and then his other friend in Colchester who was you know serving as a broker somebody else wanted to you know maybe I don't know, maybe needed a man instead of a woman. I mean, I don't know. I, I can't even imagine what the conversations were like. I, you know, it's, sorry, I'm rambling, but um, uh, yes, the, the population of slaves and whites increased over that period. And we have another question from Emily wondering about what would cells in a basement signify? They said that I knew a 1797 house where my piano lessons were in Larchmont, New York, near Long Island Sound with cells in the basement, was told it was freeing people. Um, any, any, any ideas about that, Diane? Um, sorry. I think you'd have to go to the Larchmont Historical Society and ask about that. They might know. And uh, another question here from Jerry. Did BWS keep any remains of each unknown cemetery that could now be used for DNA analysis? I'm not sure if there's. Could you repeat the first part of that question? What, what was the question? Yeah, the question reads, did BWS keep any remains of each unknown cemetery that could now be used for DNA analysis? Not that I have ever heard. I, I, I can't. I can't feature that they would have done such a thing. Okay. And you, I know, I don't know if you can see the chat right now, Diane, but you've gotten a lot of many accolades, a lot of thank yous. I'm going to go over, there is a Q&A function that I want to look into, which is have the local schools, um, have they received this information? Oh, there's a series of questions here, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just tell them to you all because they're all from the same person. 
Also, are many of the buildings shown that are still here open for tours? And is this presentation in a book yet? <laughs> no, and no, and no. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, no, I haven't shared this with anybody except the my my um, my friends on this call today. Uh, I don't have a plan to write a book, um, uh, but I do intend uh, intend to continue to to research various aspects of this. Um, this thing about the school is really interesting and I would uh, very much like to work with um, a, a teacher or teachers at Margaretville or Roxbury or some other local school to um, come up with an appropriate way to convey this information because this is where it starts. This is where um, we begin to get past um, our, our horrible history and uh, and um, learn to uh, respect and appreciate each other. So I hope so. Um, I, I'll if you want to put in a bid, a, you know a a, a a a word for me at your local school, uh, you know that would be great. And let me know if I can be of any help. Absolutely. We we did share the information of this excuse me of this webinar with the Hunter Tanners. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon, too many dogs here. Well, thank you again, Diane. I don't see any more questions and apologies to anybody whose questions I may have overlooked. Uh, oh, we have one more. Do you want to take one more before we go that just came in? It's uh, will Shirley's info be made into a book by someone else? Well, I don't know. Um, a couple people have talked about it. Um, it's uh, the it's a it was a major undertaking. Uh, I mean, the topic is much broader than um, enslavement in Delaware County. <laughs> it's an American experience in Delaware County, which she was bringing people up to the present. Um, so I don't, I don't know a, a book. I don't know. Um, maybe, um, maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe some aspect of the book will appear in print at some time or of her. She had a, a kind of a preliminary manuscript that she developed, um, but it, it's pretty rough. And, and there's, you know, there, there are more sources now even um, than when she put this together, or started to put this together. So it would take a, it would take quite a lot of work actually, but um, that would be a wonderful thing, and it would be, it would, it would be, um, uh, it would be great to honor her legacy and all the work she did for all those years uh, on behalf of Delaware County history. Excellent. Thank you so much again for all of your time. I think a lot of people are going to benefit from this webinar and certainly the recording probably for, for many years to come. I'll share on our website the bibliography that you had given us so that people can access it there. You can also email me at mthsdirector at mths.org if you'd like to receive that. And Johanna, are there any, any comments you'd like to give? So um, just to, to thank Diane for a wonderful presentation. And to remind people that our next program will be on March 24th at 7 p.m. And in honor of Women's History Month, we will be discussing three uh, prominent women from the mountaintop area. So please join us then. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.